Hey, everybody. Welcome and happy Wednesday. Hope you're all doing well. Things are going well for me. I'm busy, though, getting ready to sell a house and buy a house and finish a book. And there's a lot of moving parts going on in my world. But I hope everything's going smoothly for you all, wherever you are. Thanks for joining us tonight. We have a bunch of things to do, to talk about tonight. So let's just, I'm just checking my chat because uh, Jen, our moderator said she was having a little computer problem. So we'll just keep an eye out to see if she needs a hand. Um, so hope everything's going well for everybody. There is a bunch for us to talk about. So I'm gonna I'm I'm gonna start out by talking about a few housekeeping things before we get into the meat of the week. And boy, it's been a busy week. Been a busy week in true crime. So we have lots to talk about tonight. But I want you all to know that there still are a few slots left on the book launch team. So if you're interested, um, the book launch team, if you join, um, gives, you, uh, gives you a lot of little goodies. So to begin with, if you pre-order the book and join the book launch team, the first thing that will happen is in June, when the final manuscript is finished, you will receive an advanced PDF copy of the book. And uh, that is so you can read it ahead of everybody else and post reviews when it, um, when it hits the shelves on September 3rd. Now, some of the uh, review sites do allow you to post before it hits the, officially hits the shelves. But the big ones, Amazon, Goodreads, those guys don't allow you to do it until the day it comes out. But we want you to have it in time to read it and, and uh, have a chance to give us an honest review. So if you join the Book Launch League, you'll also get a few other things. Um, I'm going to be doing some one-on-one -on -one Zoom Q&A sort of, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, sort of uh, meetups with the folks that are part of the Book Launch League. So you'll get um, some special access to be able to have some one-on-one -on -one or some Zoom meetings with, uh, with just that small group so we can chat and hang out and, and uh, um, you can ask questions. And I'm also going to be posting exclusive updates daily from Chad Daybell's trial, which starts next week. So there'll be plenty for us to talk about in the Book Launch League. And um, that's an exchange for um, giving the book an early read and then posting a review. We are hoping against hope to hit that 60 uh, review mark for Amazon, because if we get 60 reviews po posted, then we uh, get into their algorithm and they begin reposting and, and using um, and putting the book into their uh, advertising stream. So it starts coming up on recommended pages for people. So that would be exciting. And um, that's kind of my goal. I am going to be going to CrimeCon. That, uh, that CrimeCon is in Nashville, Tennessee this year, and it starts on May 30th and runs till June 1st. Um, if you haven't been to CrimeCon, it is quite an experience for anybody who loves true crime. Uh, the Oxygen Network is there, and they, they really were last year's sponsor. I assume they're continuing to um, to be the, the primary sponsor. And boy, there is stuff like you would not believe. Lots of, of um, seminars and presentations on everything from uh, CSI style evidence. Last year, they had police dogs there and taught everybody how police dogs work. And there were, there were many, many panels by um, that were offered by people who had been witnesses, victims, people who were somehow involved in all of the cases that we're always most interested in. So really interesting time. Um, do check them out. The links are in my show notes. 
and uh, you can check out what's coming up for them. I understand that um, that sometimes the tickets are a little bit uh, steep for some folks, and um, and that could be a little bit out of your budget. But do keep in mind that they use volunteers, and you get a pe you get a ticket if you volunteer a few hours a day to direct traffic or or help set up and and take down the events. So. That's always a good thing to think about. And that link is in our show notes as well. Um, I did want to remind everybody, don't forget that we are doing uh, a, an origami crane quilt for uh, Kay and Larry Woodcock. And the pattern is in our show notes. We are um, looking for squares with a black background that finish at six inches. And then I'm gonna put it together and with the help of Tracy Goyans, we're going to get it quilted. And uh, and and I would love to be able to have this finished um, shortly after Chad's trial is over. But we'll see how far we get. But do remember, this is uh, I got a couple of of the first squares. Um, when you're finished with your squares, please um, drop them in an envelope to me at the same address. The address is in our show notes the same address where you get wristbands. And that reminds me, we still have wristbands and I am happy to send them to you if you send me a self-addressed stamped envelope. And I would love very much if during the trial, we really flood social media with pictures of people wearing their wristbands. And um, they are purple and blue and they say justice for JJ and Tylee. So um, please consider dropping me an envelope and I will get wristbands out to you as soon as I can. And uh, hopefully we'll have them out so that everybody, if you already have one, please, please, this next week, um, take a minute to snap a picture of yourself wearing it and put it on your Facebook page, put it on your Twitter, put it on your, your Instagram. Um, make it your your profile picture. We definitely want um, to raise awareness that this trial is going on. So tonight, I have a ton of things to talk about. So as usual, I will be kind of running through the updates on the different cases, and then we'll be asking for questions. So about the first hour, I'm going to give you a rundown on things please hold your questions. It makes it much easier for Jen to find them. And then you put all the cues or question marks or something at the beginning of your question to call attention to it. We answer as many questions as we can in the time that we have allowed. If I don't get to your question, please post it in our comments because I do read and answer all the comments. I also review the chat every week. So, um, and I always say, if you're a little shy and you're not really excited about pu publicly posting your question, drop me an email because I answer those too. Um, and that email, the email address is in my show notes. If you would like to be a part of a book launch league, you can do that by going to thegoodlory.com, which is the website for our book launch league. So, um, Please consider doing that if you would like an advanced PDF copy of the book uh, in return for posting a review. Now, let's dive in. I'm going to start with Daybell because that is the thing that is really closest on the horizon for us. We have a lot of other things to talk about. We have a little bit of Coburger news, we've got a little bit of Delphi news, we've got a lot, a little bit of Murdoch news, a lot of uh, Jody Hildebrand and Ruby Frankie news, as well as several other cases. So buckle up, because it's going to be a busy ride. So let's talk about Daybell first. Uh, jury questionnaires went out uh, with jury summons within the last couple of weeks. They're not, they're not really specific about when those went out. But jurors started returning their jury questionnaires this week. So in the last three days, they've had jurors coming in and bringing in their jury questionnaires. 
from there, they will actually start jury questioning on Monday. Now, early on, Judge Boyce said he wanted to do as much jury selection this week before April 1st as he could. But, you know, that's really subject to everyone else's availability as well as the availability of Ada County Court. So it appears that they're not doing as much of that jury selection as I think Judge Boyce had hoped. And most of the, the actual questioning of the jurors will be done starting on Monday. Now, the way it works is they're going to bring in panels of, of 12 at a time. So they'll fill the jury box. Now, they sent out for Lori's trial around 1,200 subpoenas, jury summons. I don't know how many, but I'd be very surprised if they didn't send out at least that many, if not more, for Chad's trial. And, uh, and so the next thing that's going to happen is they'll bring them into the, into the courtroom, they'll seat them in the jury box, and they will go through a series of general questions. Usually what that means is, by a show of hands, can you tell me yes, no, yes, no? And by then, they they these are very generalized questions. Once they have gotten through to see whether at a really like 30,000 foot level there is bias or there are, are concerns, then they will take that jury panel and they will question each of those jurors individually. Now they're doing this for a couple of reasons. One being that there are many things that they don't want the whole jury panel to hear they're asking of, of the other jurors. So they don't want to tip off the jurors as to what they're going to be asking before they're actually asked the questions. The other thing is that, as we saw in Lori's trial, they're going to be getting into some fairly personal information. They're going to be asking people, have you ever been the victim of a crime? If so, what happened? Um, have you ever had a family member who's been a victim of a crime? If so, what happened? But they're also going to be asking things like, do you have any health problems that could preclude you from being on this jury? Um, are you a member of the LDS church or what is your church affiliation? And, and do you think that would get in the way of you being a fair and impartial juror? Have you heard about the case? Have you seen the, the uh, Netflix documentary? Have you seen uh, the, the Dateline episodes? And all of those things put together, they will decide as they go through which jurors are going to be dismissed for cause, meaning that one side or the other, and the, jur the judge agrees, um, will, will be dismissed because they clearly have a bias, or there is some other reason why they can't serve. Now, the judge has already said he believes that this case is going to be at least eight weeks and probably more like 10 weeks. And I have to agree, um, knowing what I've heard about uh, John Pryor putting on a pretty vigorous defense, and we'll get to that in a minute, um, I think that it, that we're going to be looking at at least 10 weeks. We're going to be looking at eight weeks of, of um, guilt and innocence phase and another two weeks of, if he is found guilty, another two weeks of penalty phase. So... Um, so the jury selection happens next week, and that is easily going to take a week. So I don't think we are go going to actually see testimony because all that jury selection is going to happen. And then they're going to bring in the top 24, and they're going to start asking um, each side to give their peremptory challenges. And, and so... They each side is going to get challenges where they can challenge a juror. They don't have to give a reason. They just say, I don't want that guy or I, I yeah, she, she's got to go and they don't have to give a reason for it. It's not for cause. Um, those are strictly for, it just could be, I don't like the way they look. Um, so that happens. And then when they finally seat the jury, then the judge swears the jury in and gives them a fairly lengthy um, jury uh, 
preparatory jury instruction. After that happens, then we'll have opening statements. Now, as we saw in Lori's trial, they seated the jury and then the judge said, and it was like midday, and the judge said, I'm not going to jump into this, come back in the morning and start your opening statement. So I expect that's what will happen in Chad's trial as well. But I think they're going to have a little more trouble seating a jury because Lori's trials already happened a year ago and people still remember those things. So it may be a little more difficult for them to seat a jury. And it could be that we don't see opening statements until a week from Wednesday. So I, I wouldn't expect that we're going to see opening statements any earlier than that. That's my prediction, but I'm just reading the tea leaves like everybody else. So, you know, I can say I'm making an educated or at least semi-educated guess and a guess based on my experience. But, uh, you know, I don't think anyone knows for sure. I don't think even, even the folks who are involved in the case, the prosecutors and, and defense attorneys really know for sure. So we do know that Rachel Smith asked to be uh, dismissed from the case. She was the Missouri attorney who had been brought in as a consultant and was um, uh, and um, she asked to be relieved of the case. She, it, I think part of it was that, that the prosecution was having a real hard time. Madison County was having a hard time um, justifying continuing to, to pay her. Interestingly enough, um, she was recently hired by Canyon County, which is another rural county in Idaho, um, to help with the Jeremy Best case. Jeremy Best was uh, is a man who was arrested and charged with murder. The prosecution is seeking the death penalty. Um, it, it's a really awful case. Uh, he stormed into his home or ex's home, I, I can't remember now, uh, and murdered her. She was pregnant with their second child and then took their little boy who was less than two uh, and disappeared with him. He, there was a big manhunt that went on for quite a while and he, Ultimately, he was located, he was in the midst of some sort of a psychotic break. He was, they found him naked in a sleeping bag by the side of the road behind his truck. And um, the little boy was deceased in his truck. So it's a horrible case. And it is in a very small, once again, a very small rural uh, county uh, and there's only actually one prosecutor there. So it made some sense to bring in uh, to bring in Rachel Smith and have her help out, particularly since she's been working on on the Daybell case for a couple of years and has become quite familiar with Idaho law and and has done all of the research into case law. And so she's she's it made some sense to bring her in. But uh, Madison County has requested that the attorney general uh, assign an assistant AG to the case, and they have done so. So they will have the full, uh, the full cast of five attorneys. They will have Lindsey Blake as the lead attorney, Rob Wood, who is the Madison County DA and special prosecutor, um, attorneys from both their offices, plus the AG. So they'll be back to five. Uh, John Pryor, on the other hand, as far as I know, is still going it solo. And that is a big ask to do an eight week trial, a 10 week trial. Um, that is absolutely grueling, exhausting. And when you don't have any help, I mean, the only thing you can do is hope and pray that you stay healthy uh, and and that you can continue on. I mean, in a long trial, things come up. We we saw that in Lori's trial. Uh, Lindsey Blake's father passed away unexpectedly, and the judge was uh, the judge adjourned court early on a Thursday, and then um, 
we didn't come back to court until Tuesday to allow all of the people to go back to Rexburg for his memorial service and allow Lindsay Blake time with her family. So, you know, I mean, life moves on even when trials are underway. And I do not envy John Pryor his job at this point without any uh, any kind of backup. So uh, I, John Pryor has been very, uh, very vocal about the fact that he will be calling witnesses, unlike Lori's, uh, Lori's attorneys, that they are not going to rest and uh, without putting on a vigorous defense. So I think we're going to see a much different trial this time and potentially juicier. Uh, I think we're going to see uh, him put on a vigorous defense. He says he's got seven experts. I don't know what those experts are, but I would guess, um, if I had to guess, I would guess that one of them is going to be a, an expert on the FBI cast process. We've talked before in other videos, and I've, and I, I've written at length in, in, in our newsletter, about the issue of scientific evidence and when is it scientific and when is it junk science? And so one of the concerns has been the information that comes from phone and GPS locator kinds of information has been around forever. And, but it's only been within the last handful of years that this cast process has come up. And what happened was the FBI developed a different kind of an algorithm for how they analyze the cast information. And it, it's the same raw data. It's just a different formula that they're applying to how they analyze it. Now, I'm not a math whiz and uh, certainly not a tech giant, but I do understand that across the country, public defenders have been expressing concern about whether or not that cast data that comes from that algorithm is reliable and whether or not it is scientifically supportable. And that, that is the question. So it wouldn't surprise me at all to see John Pryor have an expert about that data location stuff. Um, because a lot of, of defense attorneys across the country have been um, have been calling into question whether or not that algorithm that the FBI uh, applies to that raw data is reliable. So, so uh, a lot of people have asked, will Lori Vallow be called to as a witness? Now, um, interestingly enough, the uh, John Pryor did a little brief interview with a, one of the local reporters here in Boise. And in, in essence, it was uh, John Pryor saying a lot of nothing. I mean, he didn't really give any real information about what was going to go on in the trial. But he was asked whether Lori was going to testify or not, which he didn't answer. He said anybody can be called as a witness in a trial. It would be extremely unlikely. And there's and, and for two reasons. One is because she still has charges pending in Arizona and she has a Fifth Amendment right not to incriminate herself. And two, she still got an appeal pending for which she also has a Fifth, fifth Amendment right not to uh, not to incriminate herself. So I I I think there's nearly a hundred percent chance she will not testify. Will Chad testify? That's a good question. I think it's possible. Um, if I were to say, Chad is one of those people. We're going to talk about the Frankie Hildebrand case, and I I think there are some real parallels between Chad and um, between um, Kevin Frankie. So I want to talk about that a little bit more when we get to Ruby Frankie. But I think that Chad is one of those folks, and and we've talked at length about the fact that. Lori and Chad both grew up in that LDS culture. And, 
And regardless of what you think about the church doctrine, it is a culture. And one of the things that is really um, inculcated in, in people who belong to the church is a compliance with leadership. And I think that there is a very good chance that Chad is going to defer to John Pryor with that same mindset, that same, I'm going to defer to this person who knows more, who's more of an expert, who I'm, and I'm going to take their advice. So I don't think that Chad will testify, but I think there might be a little bit higher possibility than there was in Lori's case. Um, there were a lot of people who thought Lori would take the stand because she believed that she had all the answers. But still, um, ultimately, she took her lawyer's advice and didn't. And I think that's going to be what Chad will do as well. Um the state is seeking to introduce um, a statement from Tammy Daybell. They've asked the court for a motion in limine. Now, what we know is that the court held a closed hearing last week on this issue, but we do not know what the court ruled. And it doesn't appear that the court has issued an order yet. Uh, it wasn't on the on, on the the court's database as of this morning when I was looking. Um, so it doesn't appear that the judge that the court has issued an order yet. So we don't know what the judge's decision was, and we may very well have to wait until trial to find that out. Um, I wanted to bring you up to date on Lori's uh, stuff because she still got stuff. Um, first of all, the last I've seen is that there is a, a deadline for the transcript to be filed in, in the Idaho case for her appeal. So what happens when a person files a notice of, that they intend to appeal? A person has 30 days after sentencing to, um, to appeal. So in Lori's case, she had that 30 days after her sentencing in July. However, in order for the appeal to actually go forward, there has to be a written transcript because appeals are taken strictly on, from, on paper. Um, so there has to be a written transcript. And um, the written transcript has to be um, created by a court certified transcriptionist. And it it is a, an extremely labor intensive job. Usually what it involves is a, one transcriptionist who actually tra listens to the recording and transcribes what everyone is saying on a keyboard. And another person who then goes through and checks the transcript against the recording um, and reads the transcript as they're listening to the recording and compares the two to confirm that they are, um, that the transcription is accurate. So it's a very complex process and um, it's very labor intensive. So they, the transcriptionist has requested and been granted several extensions to get the transcript done. The most recent deadline is the 17th of April. So what's going to happen there is either the transcript is going to be ready on the 17th of April, or they're going to ask for another month long uh, extension to get it done. I would say it's probably nearing completion and it wouldn't surprise me if, if they, uh, if they're ready to go by the end of, or the, by mid April. Um, so, I think probably we will start seeing some opening briefs in the appeal, uh, in Lori's appeal. Now, remember her trial attorneys, Jim Archibald and John Thomas are not involved in that appeal. She was appointed an appellate attorney, a state um, public defender that specializes in appellate issues. 
And in fact, um, Jim Archibald was import, was appointed to represent Jeremy Best. So it's interesting he and uh, Rachel Smith are sort of uh, uh, squaring off again. So, um, and Lori's still in Arizona and um, they had a case management uh, hearing late last week. And uh, the Arizona case, the next case management uh, hearing is set for the 24th of April. And the final pretrial conference at this point is set for July 25th. And her trial date is now set for August 1st. So at one point, the trial minutes just showed that it had to start before September, I think it was 9th because that's when her speedy trial period runs, but it actually is on the docket now for, um, for August 1st. Now, in the next few weeks, we have a bunch of trials starting. So um, in addition to Daybell, we have several other trials that are getting started that we're gonna talk about. I did wanna mention that there is a motion pending in the Koberger case, and this is kind of a, I don't know, kind of a quirky little motion. It'll be interesting to see what happens, but it, it is going to be heard um, sometime next week. The judge did agree to hear it very quickly. So what happened was the judge put an order in place, which several months ago, that said neither side can contact potential jurors, that we, we don't want either side having any contact with people who will be potential jurors. That makes perfect sense. It's a, it's a small uh, area. It's, a, it's another small county population-wise, small ju potential jury pool. But um, then the defense filed a motion for change of venue. And as a part of that change of venue motion, we saw this in the Daybell case, the defense has to present information um, to convince the court that there's so much saturation of, of information about the case in that county that it will be very difficult to find an unbiased jury. So the same thing happened in Valor Daybell. They did some polling and they went out and did a little bit of um, kind of like market research. And, uh, and, and did some surveys. Well, they started doing that in, uh, in Koberger's case, and, and they started sending folks out to knock on doors and ask people's opinions about things. And the prosecution found out about it. And the prosecution promptly filed a motion saying, oh, no, no, you are witness tampering because, or jury tampering, because you are talking to potential jurors. So it's an interesting, uh, it's an interesting little quirk kind of brought on by because the judge entered that earlier order. I don't think it's going to go anywhere. I think the judge is going to say this is a permissible contact with members of the community who could potentially be jurors, uh, and and that it doesn't, it isn't going to be considered witness tampering. It's a common practice, but. Um, it's just one more little wrinkle in Koberger that's going to slow down getting it to trial. Um, you might recall that now they're talking about 2025 as a potential summer of 2025 as the potential trial window. Um, and uh, that, that might just, um, if the court were to grant a change of venue, that might just um, give Ada County, poor Ada County, uh, time to recover from the Daybell, Vallo and Daybell cases before they have to try yet another high, uh, high visibility case. So, and on to the Delphi shit show, which is the case that just keeps giving. In the, in the most outrageous twist to Delphi to date, or maybe second most outrageous after disqualifying his lawyers, the judge who is who has the the decision making about approving public defense spending has denied their motion for 
uh, to approve funds for experts in his case. It 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 defies logic. I mean, I'm I'm telling you what, as a as a former defense attorney, it makes my head want to explode. Now, in my home state of Oregon, um, there was a commission that was uh, assigned the task of uh, deciding uh, public defense expenditures. And it wasn't up to judges. The only time you really went in front of a judge was if by chance your expenditure was denied and you wanted the judge to overrule that. You could go to a judge and say, judge, the commission said, I can't have this expert. Here's all the reasons why I need it. Will you order them to, to pay for the expert? But that is not what has happened here. In, in, uh, in Delphi, in Indiana, in order to get an expert, the judge is the one who has to approve the financial expenditures. And this judge hates the defense. And she has just categorically refused to approve all their experts. It's crazy. And it's absolutely impossible for me to see how Richard Allen doesn't end up on appeals forever if he gets convicted. But the tragic part about it is Richard Allen is not well, and there is there is ample evidence to call into question his actual involvement in the case. Now, say what you want. There are a lot of people who believe he's the guy. There are an awful lot of people, defense attorneys included, who think that the state's case is really, really thin. And to make it worse, that there are alternative theories that could raise substantial reasonable doubt. But if Richard Allen actually gets convicted based on the fact that the judge has denied him his due process, what he gets is just another trial, which means he remains in custody until he can be retried. And that, I'm afraid, might be a death sentence for Richard Allen. I'm, I'm very concerned that um, he is not going to survive a, a retrial in his case, not going to survive jumping through the hoops of an appeal and then going through a whole other trial. Um, so that's really concerning. But it has gotten so absurd that the a, an attorney who represents the attorney who represents Richard Allen's attorneys, Baldwin and Rosie, has started a GoFundMe campaign to fund Richard Allen's experts. That is that is so beyond outrageous that it it really does make my head want to explode. Um, now, if you are really interested in Delphi and all of the legal ins and outs of that Delphi case, you have to be following Bob Mata from Defense Diaries. Bob and his wife Allie have covered this case really since the beginning. And just as I kind of decided to write a book about, about Daybell and, and really got deeply into Daybell and am probably as conversant with that case as anybody out there, um, it, that is the case for Bob and Allie and Delphi. Um, Bob practices in Illinois. He has driven and been to every hearing in Indiana and, uh, so it, it is going to be, um, if you really want to dive into that case, absolutely follow Bob and Allie. The links are in our show notes. And, um, oh, and Murdoch, believe it or not, there's interesting new, new things happening in Murdoch. Now, as you might recall, he was convicted and sentenced to life without parole in the murders of his wife, Maggie, and his son, Paul. He also was convicted on a whole host of, of theft and uh, financial crime-related uh, cases. He pled guilty to those. And he pled guilty to them because there were also a slew of federal crimes for similar federal crimes for those thefts as well. There were actually different crimes, some at the federal level, some at the state. So because he had been 
he pled guilty to the financial crimes in state court, the feds offered him a deal. He got 27 years on the, he, he uh, entered a plea agreement for 27 years sentence on the state financial crimes. He pled guilty to the federal crimes and was set to be sentenced, I think it's next week, on the federal crimes. The deal was, the plea deal for him was that he would be completely honest about all of his federal crimes, who else was involved, and where all the money was. Because one of the things that has perplexed everyone is over the years that he was actively stealing money, they estimate he stole somewhere between 10 and $12 million. Where is that money? Because he was virtually broke when, when he was arrested. So nobody can figure out where that money is, and the feds are still looking for it. So one of the terms of his plea agreement was they would allow his sentence to be concurrent with the sentence in state court. So the federal charges would mirror the state court charges as long as he was honest about who else was involved, what he did, and where the money is. And he re and one of the things that was in that plea agreement was an agreement that he would submit to polygraphs about whether or not he was telling the truth. Now, Murdoch's position has been all the money's gone. He spent it all. But $12 million is a lot of money to spend and have nothing, nothing to show for it. So, um, so the feds aren't convinced. They're, they think that there's something else going on. They think there's money out there somewhere and they're trying to find it. So they administered polygraphs to him and he failed them. Not only did he fail them a little bit, but he showed deception on the answer to every polygraph question. So the state or the feds just a day or so ago filed a, a notice saying, your plea deal is off the table and we're gonna ask the judge to sentence you to the maximum federal sentence and we will not agree that it will be concurrent running at the same time as your state charges. So I realize he's been sentenced to life in prison on the on the murder case. But all good prosecutors are going to tell you they want belt and suspenders both. They want to be able to have this in the wings in case for some reason that life in prison sentence gets overturned on appeal. So uh, uh, those sentences are always appealed. Um, Putty and the Grifter, his lawyers, Dick Harputlian and, and Jim Griffin, have already said uh, they've already filed notices of appeal and it, it's all going up on appeal. So it makes perfect sense for the prosecutors, both at the state and federal level, to want backup charges. And uh, so the feds have now said, uh-uh-uh, Alex, you didn't tell the truth. And now you are uh, you are subject to open sentencing from the court, and we are not going to be making recommendations that your sentence be concurrent, and we are not going to be making recommendations that, that you, uh, you get a sentence that mirrors the state charges. The judge is free to, to give you whatever he thinks is is the proper sentence. So that will be coming up next week and will be really interesting. I know that um, Mandy Matney and Liz Farrell and um, uh, True Sunlight used to be the Murdoch Murders podcast. I'm sure we'll be covering that very carefully. Unfortunately, um, there are no cameras allowed in federal court, so we will have to rely on the folks who attend to report to us what is going to happen. I also understand Eric Bland, who represents several of the victims, including um, the uh, Satterfield family, that um, that he, I'm sure he will be there as well. He's asked to, to um, address the court when it comes to um, victim impact statements. 
So, and the other big news that happened this week is Clerk of the Court, Becky Hill, resigned effective immediately. It was a She gave a press conference, which was the weirdest thing you have ever seen. And during that press conference, her attorney announced that she was not going to run for re-election. She then gave up, got up and gave a statement. And at the very end of her statement, she said, my resignation is effective immediately. So up until the very end of that conf press conference, we didn't know that she was out of there. Uh, so we'll wait to see uh, what happens. But it appears that her assistant, uh, Clerk of the court will be taking over and then they will have an election in November. So um, she said, I'm doing this because there's still a week for people to file their intention to run. And uh, so I want to give people a chance to do that. She said she was making the decision because she wanted to spend more time with her grandchildren. However, it is really interesting because within a couple of hours, um, Joel Waldman from Surviving the Survivor interviewed her co-author on the book about the case. And he said he had been he had been interviewed by SLED, the South Carolina Law Enforcement Division, that's their state police, um, the Friday before. Uh, so it would not surprise me at all if we see an arrest uh, coming down the pike pretty quickly. Um, we know that there are ethics and uh, state ethics. Uh, in, there's an ethics, state ethics investigation going on. We know that Becky Hill's son, who was the IT manager at the courthouse, has been charged with... Uh, uh, wiretapping with recording telephone calls when people didn't know they were being recorded. And um, so I think there's much more coming um, involving Becky Hill. Um, we don't have much of an update on Madeline Soto. Uh, the stepfather has been charged in uh, SA in incidents. Uh, there were photographs and um, videos uh, that were recovered off his phone that uh, proved that he had been abusing Madeline since she was eight years old. And But nothing more has happened. They are waiting for autopsy results and that I think we'll likely see murder charges as well for him. And I wouldn't be at all surprised to see the current charges get wrapped up in, in the murder charges and them all to be tried together. Right now he has a trial date set, but I would be very surprised if that actually goes to trial. Um, Wendy Adelson, I mean, not Wendy, <laughs> Donna Adelson has a trial date set on the 30th of September. We're going to be really interested to watch that one. And uh, there'll be a lot going on. Now, Karen Reed, Karen Reed, who is the uh, who who is the girlfriend of the uh, Canton police officer who died, she is accused of hitting him with her car and accidentally um, killing him. And she's been charged with some form of negligent homicide. So that starts on the 16th. And uh, there has been all sorts of controversy about that. There have been uh, people who support Karen Reed and who say that she's being framed because this is a, a conspiracy among law enforcement officers, both Boston Police Department and Canton, which is a suburb. And, um, and people who say she's guilty. So there's a lot going on. And that one's going to be really interesting because there are some indications and the FBI and the feds actually did convene, a, the FBI did investigate and the feds did convene a grand jury. Um, and there is some indication that, that um, it's possible that she was, uh, that there's corruption within the police department, let's put it that way. And that the people who were involved in the investigation were all friends and or relatives of 
um, the people whose home Karen Reed and John O'Keefe were at uh, the night he died and uh, where his body was found. So that's coming up. Um, the state in the Harmony Montgomery case filed a motion to compel Adam Montgomery to come to court. And, uh, and um, in some states, we call it a drag order, which means if you don't show up, we just drag your ass to court. And uh, I hope very much that that's going to be granted and that Adam Montgomery is actually going to have to come and stand before the court, hear the victim impact statements and receive his sentence. So um, the judge hasn't ruled on that yet, but it has been filed. And I expect, uh, I, I, I kind of expect the judge is going to grant it. I think everyone was very frustrated that he decided to, to uh, sit out the trial. So um, before we dive into uh, Ruby, Frankie, and Jody Hildebrand, because I've got a fair amount to talk about with them, uh, I, I do want to just mention kind of in passing that uh, there was a big deal when uh, rapper P. Diddy's homes were, uh, were multiple homes in multiple states were all simultaneously federal warrants were served and they were, the properties were searched. P. Diddy and, uh, and his sons, none of them have been arrested and, uh, and no one's quite sure where old Diddy is, although uh, everybody says he's still in the United States. Some people were concerned because he has a private jet and he might be flying off somewhere that doesn't have an extradition treaty with the US, but um, I'm pretty sure they're keeping, the, the feds are keeping very close eye on him. They know where he is. So that will be interesting to see how that plays out. Those cases are uh, allegations of sex trafficking that actually go back for quite a few years. So uh, it very well could be yet another uh, Ghislaine Maxwell and, and that guy named Jeff's uh, uh, try a uh, case. So now I want to talk about Ruby and Jody. This last week, we finally, there was a huge dump of, of information um, there in response to FOIAs after their sentencing. So we recently got this huge dump of information some of the things that were included in that were Kevin Frankie's two interviews that he did with law enforcement, uh, jail telephone calls that both Ruby and Jody made from jail, as well as a copy of Ruby's uh, journal that she kept during the time that they were holding the children um, at, at uh, Jody's home. And the journal itself is absolutely harrowing. Um, if you think that the information that you heard during the, in the probable cause affidavit and during sentencing was awful, um, that really just scratched the surface of, of the awfulness. But the other really fascinating thing is now we've talked before about the fact that there was a book that was published in 2012 by a man named John Pontius. Now, John Pontius claimed that he was, he was simply writing down and, and operating as the Scrivener for a person, a man named Spencer. And Spencer was telling him his stories of his near-death experiences and the fact that when he had these near-death experiences, he went to heaven and he was given visions of what the end times were going to be and, and that, the, that Jesus was coming back and, and that the tribulations were set to begin and what that was going to look like and that he had been allowed to um, to die and to come back so that he could bring that message to people to be ready because it, the 
the tribulation was imminent. So John Pontius wrote all these things down and it was published. It was published by Cedar Fork Publishing, which happened to be the publisher that Chad Daybell worked for and the publisher who published the first of Chad Daybell's books. They weren't really sure when they published this book whether or not it was going to be, uh, it, was, it was going to sell, it was going to be successful. And it was successful beyond anyone's wildest dreams. So this is the book. Let, let me drop that. Shortly after the book was published, John Pontius, the author, died. And shortly after the book was published, a man came forward and said, I'm Spencer. Um, John Pontius used Spencer as a pseudonym for a man whose name is Thomas Harrison. It goes by Tom, T-H-O-M, Harrison. And um, Tom Harrison then started talking about his experiences, his near-death uh, experiences, his visions of the end times. And he started giving firesides. Now, firesides are meetings often in people's homes where people teach LDS doctrine, uh, but they're more like home Sunday schools. Um, they're they're less they're they're informal in small groups where they talk about church doctrine and, and teach. So Tom Harrison started giving these firesides and it didn't take very long before the church said, hang on, this is not, this is not um, sanctioned doctrine. And Tom Harrison then put out a, an open letter, which if you get in touch with Tom Harrison, that's the first thing he will do is send you his open letter. He has sent it to quite a few creators. And um, it essentially says, I'm really sorry that I told John Pontius about all the things that happened to me. Um, and I'm really sorry that John Pontius misquoted me. And when I told him the, uh, the changes that needed to be made to the manuscript, he didn't make them. And the rights to the book are owned by the Pontius family. And I don't have any input on, on what happens with the book. <clears throat> and um, I, I wish I had never told anybody about my visions, but I really just wanted to, to do good. I wanted people to know I, I, I was trying to do something good. And um, really sort of distanced himself from the story, denounced the book, and lo and behold, was appointed bishop of his ward immediately after. So Tom Harrison got in line. He is still an active member of the LDS church. Um, but <laughs> the book took off. The book really took off and has a life of its own. Lori Vallow read it um, and was uh, utterly taken by it and believed that she was she was one of the people that, that uh, Tom Harrison had foretold. Um, it's been reported that she and Chad met with Tom Harrison. And, um, it, and there are a number of other recent cases that have direct ties to Tom Harrison and Visions of Glory. The first of one, which is Tim Ballard. Tim Ballard was the founder of um, Operation Underground Railroad, which was started as he was a long-term, long-time LDS member. He started this group to rescue people out of human trafficking. He had this whole, he, you know, they they would do these insertion teams, like these undercover teams. They would go into third world countries and they would rescue people from, from human trafficking. And it all turned out that there was a lot of very untoward stuff going on on these missions. He was um, soliciting the women who were on the missions to act as his girlfriend or his wife. And that included them being sexual. 
It included them doing things they were not comfortable with. It turned out that he was deciding where to, the next mission was going to be based on his psychic and um, that he was regularly using ketamine and other uh, uh, psychedelic drugs to take psychedelic trips. And, um, and uh, he was very closely associated with the attorney general in Utah, Sean Reyes. Um, so, and he also, it was well known that he was close to uh, several of the, the elders, the, the leaders, the 12 apostles uh, of the LDS church. It all blew up. Uh, these people all started making allegations. The interesting thing from my standpoint was the fact that Tom Harrison is a therapist and teaches other therapists, which we'll talk about in a minute. He also uh, was, uh, it, Tim, uh, Tim Ballard was a follower of his and he actually asked Tom Harrison to come to get involved with Operation Underground Railroad, which Tim Ballard has now been uh, tossed out of and is no longer involved in the organization and had to go start his own charity, which now is doing nothing because nobody wants to have anything to do with him because he's like radioactive. But Tom, he went and got Tom Harrison to commit to provide therapy for these victims of human trafficking that they were supposedly rescuing. There is absolutely no evidence that Tom, Tim Ballard ever successfully rescued anyone out of human trafficking, but they made a lot of money and they went into a lot of foreign countries and they, he sold this story. It ended up being a movie called The Sound of Freedom. That was a highly, highly fictionalized version of, of events. And um, it, 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 much of it was, very, it was disproved. It turned out to be uh, much less of a true story and much more of a, 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 of a yarn. So um, all of that's been very discredited these days. And, um, but interestingly enough, he was a, a, an adherent to Visions of Glory. Which brings us to Jody Hildebrand and Ruby Frankie. Ruby Frankie was trained by Tom Harrison and appeared on conference panels with him. And what he was one of her mentors. And she clearly, by much of what happened in what you see in some of these journals and Kevin Frankie's interviews, she was very much down the same rabbit hole as Lori Vallow. Jody Hildebrand believed that she was having visions, that she was a prophet, that she was seeing visions of the end of days, that she was... Um, uh, that she was bringing all of these people who she was offering therapy to, to, uh, to get them ready for the end of times. Uh, I mean, it, so much of it sounds like Lori Vallow. It's terrifying. And let's remember that Lori Vallow also believed that her, and you read Ruby Ruby Frankie's diaries, she was talking about her children being possessed by the devil. She was talking about them being, being evil and, and that their behavior was being controlled by the devil. Who does that sound like? It sounds like Lori Vallow saying that her children have been taken over by evil spirits and demons. And um, very much very much this was going on. Jody was having trances. She was um, giving people information um, uh, that, that she was making predictions, telling people what was going to happen. She was in the midst of looking for property out in Arizona. Where does, how does this sound? Who does this sound like? She was looking for acreage out in Arizona where they could take the children as well as other people out there to have them cleansed of their evil spirits. 
and it sounds suspiciously like a white camp. So there are so many parallels with this. It is fascinating. Um, when you read my book, you will see um, that there is a true, there is a true schism coming in the LDS church um, because there is a large faction, not just Lori Vallow, not just Jody Hildebrand, not just Tim Ballard. There is a large faction um, who are fundamentalists. They want to get back to Joseph Smith's teachings. They think that the all of the the uh, progressive things that have happened in the church are simply put the church into apostasy and that their job is to bring the church back to its roots before Jesus comes again. And they're bent on doing it. So there are some really, really interesting things coming up. Um, and it's just fascinating to me that they're all enmeshed. They're all related. Um, you can't sort out Chad Daybell from, from Ruby Frankie and, and Hildebrand. Uh, I mean, the only real difference is the fact that Jody Hildebrand figured out how to make a bunch of money. I already um, almost said something else. Uh, make a bunch of money off of it. And the way she did that was she was a therapist. She got herself on the recommended therapy list that bishops handed out. And then if the bishop said to someone, uh, one of their congregation members, I think you need therapy. And they said, I'd love to, but I can't afford it. The bishop would say, well, let me pay for it out of my discretionary funds because the bishops had had funds to help their, their congregants. And so um, Ruby Frankie's niece, uh, uh, not Ruby, uh, Jody Hildebrand's niece, uh, Jessie, said that she was subjected to a lot of the same treatment as Ruby's children. And one of her punishments and her jobs was to keep track of all of Jody's billing. And she remembers that about 80% of what Jody made came from the church. And let's remember, she had a $5 million house and a couple of boats and a, a lot of toys. So, um, she was dragging down a lot of money. Now, Chad Daybell wasn't that successful. Uh, while he he was uh, definitely able to convince people that he was a prophet and that he he had a line on when the end of the world was coming, he didn't. He wasn't a shrewd businessman, and he wasn't able to uh, to generate the kind of income that that uh, Jody Hildebrand was. So there is so much. Um, so many parallels, and um, uh, the 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 uh, interviews that Kevin Frankie did with uh, with police are sad. Um, what I'll say once again um, is that that part of and. I'm not trying to jump on the LDS church. I, I'm trying to bring to light the, the issue of this particular faction um, and how destructive they are. But the, the culture within the LDS church is very hierarchical. It, it's very, first of all, it's very patriarchal. And it's, but it it also really depends on a very structured hierarchy, and people who are raised in the church, and and their parents were raised in the church, they are raised to believe within that culture. They are raised to defer to authority, and so. For Chad Daybell and for Kevin Frankie, I think both of them at some point deferred to authority. And Kevin Frankie, I think, um, quite a bit. I mean, when Jody said, I'm having visions and I believe that you should do X, Y, Z and you should be separated from your children and you should be uh, separated from your wife until you do all these things to bring yourself back into the fold. I, 
you 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 see in his interview that he was compliant because there was there was a piece of him that was already inculcated to that there was a piece of him that already was that was the way he was raised um to to defer to authority and so it's unfortunate that he wasn't able to understand that Jody didn't really have authority, just the same way that Lori's followers, the Melanies and, and, and Zulema weren't able to understand that Chad didn't really have that authority either. Uh, just the same way that Alex Cox didn't really understand that Chad didn't have that authority. Um, so it's really, as these cases have gone along, it's been interesting to see how they dovetail and, and that we're seeing these same themes over and over again. I have talked way too long and it is time for questions. And I know that Jen has been marking some with stars. I saw a couple of cues go by. So please post your questions. In the meantime, while Jen's doing that, please like and subscribe. Um, by the way, uh, the newsletter, if you are uh, have signed up to get newsletters, newsletters will be coming to you, especially having to do with the Daybell trial. So um, keep your eye open for those. If you haven't subscribed, please do, because I do uh, write newsletters kind of doing a deep dive into legal issues. For So for those of you that are kind of legal nerds and and uh, wonks and are interested in the in the ins and outs of, of legal issues, uh, you definitely want to subscribe there. And if you are interested in getting an advanced PDF of the book, um, please be sure and sign up there. Um, uh, we asked for the first hundred people and there are still a few slots available. So please get to thegoodlory.com and sign up. What you got for me, Jen? It looks like Jen. Jen, I'm popping you in for a minute. Okay, let me look. Can you bring in so you can star the questions? Yep, I'm popping you in. Hi. <laughs> You're on mute, but I gotcha. <laughs> I forgot. We usually do that before we hit go live, but Jen was having a little computer problem. So let's see if she can bring some questions up. In the meantime, uh, I will, I did see a question and I will pop it up while we're waiting. Uh, hi, GSD Stell. Uh, question, Lori, can the jury questionnaire ask anything about religion? Absolutely. Um, and very likely does. Um, in general terms, they're not going to ask specific things. That'll be for the the folks to flesh out as as things go on. But um, it will be up to uh, the the. Uh, I'm dealing with technical stuff and losing my train of thought. It will be up to the attorneys to ask specific questions, but the jury questionnaire will ask about religion. Now, if religion were not a component of this case, then asking about religion would not be appropriate. If there were nothing having to do with religion, then that would not be fair game uh, to be asked in jury selection. But because the church is an element of this case and because people have opinions about religion and about the LDS church, it's important to flesh that out. So it absolutely will be asked and I'm sure it was on the questionnaire. Um, if people didn't know what case they were being summoned to, the questionnaire probably telegraphed that right away, so. Let me see what else I can 
see in the questions while we're waiting for Jen. What kind of witnesses would Chad have that could help him? This is a good question. We don't know exactly, but I, I think that John Pryor's best hope is going to be witnesses who can call the physical evidence into question. One of the things we did not see in Lori's case, and I, I, I wasn't really sure why, um, whether it was because her, her attorneys didn't want to draw attention to a bad fact or uh, whether they just felt like it wasn't important enough. But I never thought that they adequately, either in their closing argument or in their, uh, in their cross, ever adequately address the issue of a hair, Lori's hair being found in the duct tape uh, on JJ's body. Now we talked about it here and certainly it, it, the issues are, um, we talked about it and, and the issue is that people shed hair every day. You don't want to see my hairbrush, right? People shed hair constantly and hair is easily transferred from one person to another. So we know that JJ lived in Lori Vallow's home. He often slept in her room, if not in her bed. Um, and there, it would be very difficult to say, okay, well, where did that, where did that hair come from? Did it come off Lori's head? Did she drop it into the, into the duct tape when she was wrapping him in duct tape? Or was it transferred off JJ's pajamas? Was it transferred off of, uh, Alex's clothes? N nobody knows. And I thought it was very surprising that they didn't bring that out on cross-examination and they didn't call an expert. So I think that that may be something that John Pryor will want to um, want to bring a witness in on. I think that he's going to bring in witnesses on the DNA testing and, and that analysis. And as I said before, I think he's going to challenge the, the technology that goes into CAST um, producing those cast reports. So uh, other than that, I don't know. I know that the um, state has asked to exclude a psychologist that he was asking to have um, come and testify. We don't know whether or not that psychologist has anything to do with Chad's mental health or whether he was trying to bring in a psychologist to talk about Lori's mental health. Don't know that. I guess we'll find that out at trial if he's allowed to testify. That was another one of those motions that was heard behind closed doors last week, and we don't know the outcome. So uh, we don't know whether... Uh... Okay, so Jen is saying she can't tag questions. So I'm going to do a quick run back through the chat and try and pick up as many questions as I can. So if you have a question, please post it. And uh, even if you have posted it further up in the chat, please um, repost it so it catches my eye because um, I'm going to zip through as quickly as I can. Um, I think this is what happens when, um, when your moderator comes in after we already started the stream. So, um, and... Jen does a, an amazing job. So uh, she is just had some computer problems earlier today. Um, yeah. Mary Howard said Pryor's also been on the news blowing his horn. Just don't like that guy. So as I've said before, John Pryor reminds me of a lot of lawyers that I practice with and dealt with um, of his age group, his generation. Uh, and, um, you know, I'd say he's okay. Um, and certainly he's been blowing his own horn. He definitely got on uh, a news show. And uh, although he didn't, uh, 
he he didn't say much. He at least got his face in front of the cameras. Yeah. So, um, so let me see. Uh, I wonder if Chad's kids will come to his trial. You know, I suspect they will. I suspect that they will come for some of it. Now it is going to be live streamed and it is in Boise and that is a five hour drive from where they are. So, uh, and they have jobs. So it, it may be a real hardship for all of them to come, but I suspect you'll see one or two of them, although you may not see them throughout the whole trial. I, I would I would be very surprised if you saw them for the whole trial. Um, here is Jenny Meow Meow um, uh, commenting on Delphi. Judge Gull is the judge in Delphi. Uh, judge Gull has made quite a few decisions that I think the Supreme Court's going to step in and fix all the damage to citizens' rights she is causing. I don't disagree. But I think what's really unfortunate is that for Richard Allen, he may very well remain in prison and perhaps die in prison by the time those appeals are, are, are those wrongs are righted. And that is a very unfortunate problem, I guess, in our system. Um, if a trial judge is this far off the mark, it is very difficult to hold that judge accountable in a meaningful way that really allows somebody due process pre-trial. Once the trial's over, then the only recourse is the appeals court, and that, that is a lengthy, onerous process. It's not quick, and it's not simple, and it would be very unfortunate um, for uh, for Richard Allen to die in prison waiting to be vindicated. Um, that would be incredibly sad. Uh, yeah, Jennifer says she's wasting the taxpayers' money with years of appeals. I can't disagree with that. Um, I, I think that she is so hell-bent on punishing the attorney she doesn't like who really, when you look at all of the filings, are really simply doing their job and zealously advocating for their client, a client who I think they sincerely believe is not guilty. Um, and, you know, I think that's the best of all worlds to have a defense attorney who believes their client is not guilty. Um, so, uh, yeah, I, I think that she's uh, once again, uh, a, a penny wise and a pound foolish by um, denying motions for experts and all kinds of other things that are ultimately going to mean that this case is going to be tied up in state appeals for years and end up being uh, way more expensive. So um, let me see what else I see. I have to lean forward a little bit to be able to read the chat. Uh, I can lean back when it's in front of me because I can see it. But, you know, everybody's old uh, eyes are getting old. Uh, yeah, I am curious. Uh, did anybody else see Becky Hill's press conference? Um, we talked about it, but I was sort of curious. Uh, let me know uh, if you if you saw it and if you thought that it was as um, odd as I did, because I thought it was strange. Uh, it's, I thought it was unusual for a clerk of the court to come out and, and have a press conference to begin with. And then when I heard, uh, when I heard that, uh, then when I heard that, uh, her co-author had been interviewed by SLED just a couple of days before, I thought, ah, oh, maybe, maybe there's more to the story. So, uh, let me just see. Oh, you guys talking about Freddie Mercury in the chat. Love me some Freddie. I'm a, I'm a old time queen fan. Um,
frustrated and disgusted. Yes, aren't we all? <laughs> okay. Susie Gay says, Ruby's journals are just wow. She had some very twisted thinking and absolute need for control. I'm thankful her kids survived. They could have been the next Tylee and JJ. I think that is absolutely true. Um, I, I heard someone remark that had, uh, had Jody was actively looking for property in Arizona. And had she been able to move that her whole deal out to Arizona, um, that person commented that, that we very it, it's very likely that those children could have been buried out there. Uh, I, I do not disagree. Uh, when when you found when we found out, which really happened this week with this big data dump, and really found out the underlying things that were going on, the parallels between Valo and and uh, Ruby are frightening. Um, the, it is very clear from her journals that she believed her children were possessed. And that she needed to do whatever she could to get the demons out of them. So I, I think that is a, a spot on observation. Um, Tennis Girl says, once I saw those tapes, oh man, I'm into that sentencing uh, they better get the max. Both deserve life, but they won't get it. Now, Utah is funny because the judge doesn't really impose the sentence. The parole board decides how long the sentence will actually be and how long before they can be eligible for parole. Uh, and certainly all of the information we saw in the last week uh, will be provided to the parole board. They will get that. I do not expect that um, that either one of them. I think I think Ruby's going to get a little bit of uh, a, a little bit of grace because it appears that at least she's making noises like she's um, regretful and like she realizes taking responsibility. Uh, Jody, not so much. Uh, it, so. I think Ruby's probably going to get less time, but I would be very surprised if either one of these women get out until these children are well into adulthood. And I think that would be appropriate. I think that the, the victims need to be protected uh, from, uh, from them until they uh, are old enough that they are safe. Uh, there's no way that Ruby was deprogrammed in less than a year. She knows what kind of games to play because she's a good girl. Yeah, I thought it was interesting. There were uh, conversations that she had with her uh, sister, I believe, that were jail call calls that were recorded, where she says, I'm not naughty. I've never been naughty. I'm a good girl. And I thought, well, that's kind of interesting thing for an adult woman accused of, of torturing her children to say. <laughs> so yeah, I, I, you know, I think that it will definitely be up to the parole board to assess whether or not she's genuinely um, reformed or whether she's just saying what they want to hear. But remember, the, the parole boards, that's their job is to is to suss that out and to decide whether or not something has been um, someone has been rehabilitated. So yeah, the, the jail call where she said, uh, uh, let me see here. Yeah. Uh, she doesn't do naughty things. Uh, pretty interesting. Yeah. Um, yeah, uh, somebody said, did anyone watch Kevin's second interview about when Jody was living with them? It was crazy. And he and it was it was harrowing. I mean, Jody was Jody was having a, a psychological meltdown. She was having a, a, a psychological crisis. 
And Ruby was worried about her. Now, remember, Jody was their therapist, but she was having a, a crisis and Ruby was worried about her. And they actually moved her into their home for a period of time. So they, the, the, she was actually living in Ruby and Kevin's home with them, with their children, which is a little scary that she was in the background sort of telling Ruby what to do to, to control her children. So yeah, really, really frightening. And um, then when Ruby and when Jody finally left their home, uh, Jody then told Ruby that she had to get Kevin out, which makes you wonder um, whether Kevin was sort of pushing back against Jody's authority. And Jody said, Kevin, you got to go. Um, but he was quite estranged uh, from the family and had not spoken to uh, his children in months. Yeah, I mean, at one point, they uh, he, she got involved with another couple of women who Kevin calls the Heathers, and they had a different, he calls it a cult, and they were talking about merging together. Um, but Jody had Ruby convinced that she needed to give Ruby her her online presence and her her followers and um, essentially her business, and that Ruby would get nothing in return except be an employee of connections. So um, it, it was very strange, very strange. Uh, Kevin said that these Heathers that Ruby went or uh, Jody went to live with them for six weeks. Jody later claimed that they'd uh, kidnapped her. Uh, they claimed that they couldn't tolerate Jody's behavior anymore and kicked her out. Um, but that uh, her, her behavior was outrageous and she was suicidal and cutting herself and all sorts of weird things were going on. Um, yeah. And uh, somebody said that uh, she wore hoodies and uh, hats even in the hottest weather and uh, wasn't too conscientious about bathing. So she smelled bad was what Kevin said. Um, <laughs> Mary, was Jody possessed? Well, I think Kevin Frankie thought she was. Uh, he was, he, he was not a Jody fan at all, but he understood that Jody controlled what Ruby did. And if he wanted any chance of getting his family back, it had to go through Jody. Um, so I think he was pretty cautious about uh, alienating her, uh, alienating Ruby by alienating her. So. Let's see what other questions we have here. Casino Kelly, is there anyone who can step in with the way Judge Gull is handling the Delphi case? It's a clear violation of his rights and, as we all mentioned, only leads to future appeal if convicted. Unfortunately, Judge Gull was appointed as a special uh, judge over this case and her authority is pretty absolute. When uh, uh, Baldwin and Rosie filed their action with the court, the Supreme Court, in order to get reinstated, they asked the Supreme Court to order that she recuse herself, and the Supreme Court refused. So at this point, unless they were willing to go back to the uh, the Supreme Court with another original action, which it's a very complex procedural way that things have to happen. Unless they are willing to do that, um, I think they're stuck with her. And um, they have filed their speedy trial notice. And um, so the trial has to be, I think it's another maybe 40 days. Um, before the trial has to happen. So I think um, I think at this point they have reconciled themselves to the fact that Judge Gull is going to be their judge and that this case is going to be one on appeal. And that is incredibly unfortunate 
for um, for Rick Allen because I, I I I'm not sure he's going to survive to get a uh, to to be exonerated by an appeal. I hope sincerely that the Indiana Innocence Project is on this one like white on rice. So, um, and I'm excited. I, I think I might've told you that I um, asked the state of Oregon because we bought a house in Oregon and we're moving back. Um, I asked the state of Oregon to reinstate me, um, the, the bar to reinstate me um, for the purpose of doing pro bono work and uh, and doing some legal work in, um, I hope, in uh, working with the Innocence Project, which is what reminded me. So I hope uh, that there's a, a lot of folks um, who are going to be <clears throat> from the Innocence Project that are going to be uh, watching uh, Delphi very closely. Okay, let's see here. Ann Chapman, but he wanted his eldest daughter arrested when she went to the home to obtain the computers and computers and documents. That to me means he knows he's culpable. I, you know, and I don't really know. I, I know that when um, when the case first happened, he was concerned uh, when the daughter went in and got the belongings for the for the younger children. That was a very long time ago, and it was really at the height of everyone's emotional state. And I, I'm not sure I'd hold that against him. I think that it was a very everybody was at a fever pitch at that point, and uh, he. It, I'm sure that that may very well be something that he regrets doing at this point. Um, so what I know about the Frankie, the younger children, the, the ones that are not adults, I think the oldest two are adults. Um, what I know is that they are currently in the custody. They, they are in the care and custody of the state. So the state uh, has wardship and will determine their placement. In general, if there is a fit and willing parent, um, the state is required to place the children with a fit and willing parent. The fact that that hasn't happened yet tells me that they have some concerns about Kevin and that they're not interested in returning the kids to him until he has proven that he is um, able to protect them. So, and what often happens is the children are in the custody legally of the state, but placed with a family member. We don't know where the children are at this point. Juvenile uh, and child welfare cases are not public. Um, and so those records are sealed. Um, we don't know for sure where the kids are, but we do know that the state has custody of them and is making placement decisions for them. They usually try and, sorry, I have a dog that's uh, decided to join the chat. Um, they usually decide uh, that try to place the children with known relatives rather than in stranger foster care. So it may very well be that they are with aunts and uncles or with the eldest sister. Um, and the state will, will examine this case very, very closely before they make any permanent decisions about uh, where they're going to be placed. Kara J, question, why do you think Lori wants a speedy trial again in Arizona? It didn't work well for her in Idaho and I would think she would want to review Chad's trial. You know, I think that Lori was advised, and we really don't know by who. Could have been by Mark Means, could have been by her father, who always styled himself as a legal expert. But she was advised, never, never waive your speedy trial rights. And to some extent, I understand that recommendation. The sooner that a defendant goes to trial, 
the less time the prosecutor has to continue investigating the case, the less time witnesses have to disappear or, um, and, and so it's kind of a double-edged sword. We always say delay is good for defendants because memories fade and people die and witnesses move away and disappear. But there are arguments on the other side that getting the case to trial as fast as possible um, is good for defendants because you hold the prosecution's feet to the fire. They don't have months and months and weeks to prepare. However, these charges have been pending for months and months and weeks and years. So it's not like the prosecution isn't ready for this case. Um, so I don't know. I just think that Lori was told by somebody and believes to her core that you should never waive your speedy trial right. And so she has decided not to. Now, Chad's trial will be done by the time her trial happens in July. So um, she, her attorney, her defense attorney down there will have the opportunity to review all that stuff. So um, it is, it, it will be interesting to see how that develops. Um, so got a couple more questions here. I'm gonna pop up real quick. Uh, Shelly's Flowers. Did Donna Adelson ask the court for permission to retain her son's attorney? What are my thoughts? She actually didn't need the court's permission, but she did have to, on the record, waive the conflict. Now, had I been advising Donna Adelson, I would have said, no, don't waive the conflict. I don't think that it's a good idea to use the same attorney that your son used, especially since he was found guilty. But, um, it, when Dan Rushbaum, uh has done, he did an interview with Joel Waldman at Surviving the Survivor, and he said, I have a longstanding relationship with the Adelsons. I have been involved with them and know them. I'm genuinely fond of Donna Adelson. And sometimes that level of trust and that level of familiarity is more important to a defendant than the legal issue of whether or not there's a conflict. Sometimes the emotional part of being, uh, of knowing that lawyer and, and trusting them on an important level is more important than the issue of whether or not there's a legal conflict. So they have. Um, they have very much uh, gone down the road of going in front of a judge and Donna saying she understood the conflict and was um, waiving it. So good question. Let me see here. Do you have any insight into Chad's alibi? I don't. Um, my understanding is that there was a notice of alibi filed. It was in amongst all of the sealed stuff that happened last week. And if it's anything like Lori Vallow's alibi, it's silly. Um, here's the thing about conspiracy. It is very difficult to say. I have. It, it's simple to be able to say. On the day that the crime, this crime was committed, I was in Hawaii. Okay. That makes perfect sense. However, how do you have an alibi for conspiracy? Because you can conspire from anywhere and at any time. So you can't say on this date when this these people were conspiring, I was in Hawaii and uh, I had no communication with them. It just, it doesn't make sense in today's technology. So uh, an alibi to a conspiracy is logically impossible. Um, and, and so it's a little silly for him to be saying, I, I have an alibi. Now, Lori's alibi was, uh, I was in Hawaii when Tammy was killed. No, I was in Arizona when Tammy was killed and I was in Hawaii and, 
And uh, I was in my own apartment with Chad when when the children were killed in Alex's apartment. And maybe that's the same thing that Chad is going to say. But it doesn't it doesn't remove the the responsibility for the conspiracy. You can't have an alibi for conspiracy. So um, so that one's a little silly, I think. Are the remains found in Chad's yard proof of conspiracy or just proof he helped after the fact? Well, aiding abed and abetting in Idaho is furthering the conspiracy. It's a good, this is a good question. So if you help someone, uh, it's the same as if you did the crime. In the in the issue in in the law around conspiracy is that two or more people agree to commit a crime and then one of them does it. So the only thing they really need to prove is that Chad knew and agreed to the crime. They don't have to prove that he was the one who actually committed the crime. Now, I think that there is circumstantial evidence that Chad was in his own backyard uh, when the children's remains were disposed of and pretty compelling evidence that he's the one who dug JJ's grave because Alex wasn't there that long. Um, uh, that when uh, on the morning that they buried JJ. Um, so I, I think there's a good argument that uh, Chad dug the grave in, in advance and Alex showed up and they put JJ in and then they covered it up. Um, because the covering up's a lot quicker than the than than the the digging. Um, but so finding the remains in his backyard, circumstantial evidence that he aided and abetted, and but uh, there's there's ample evidence of the conspiracy outside of him being in the backyard. So um, the conspiracy part is just that two or more people agree to commit a crime and one of them makes a substantial step toward committing the crime. Uh, they don't even have to uh, complete it. Uh, they just have to make a step in that direction. It's kind of like an attempt. It's called an inchoate crime, meaning uh, incomplete. So let me see. Do you think Garth will be testifying? You know, I don't know. If he testifies, I suspect he'll be a, a defense witness. And I expect that he will um, be there to testify about what happened the night that Tammy died. I think it's a, it's a little hard to explain why Alex Cox's phone was a mile and a half up the road, though. So Alex either was there as backup or he was there to do the deed. Uh, that night. And uh, it, I mean, there, the Chad's uh, uh, statement to the police was that after Tammy was out of bed, he went to Garth and asked him to come and help her put her back in bed because apparently Chad couldn't lift her without help. Um, Blaze, what do you think of the bishop who was praying over Jody? to rid her of demons and she was still a mental health professional. Would a regular person put her in the hospital? You think? Yeah. Um, I, I mean, it's a, it was a very strange happenstance. Uh, Kevin Frankie said that at one point their Bishop from their ward was coming in and spending hours with Jody and praying over her and trying to cast out the demons and, um, that uh, he fe he felt like he wasn't getting anywhere and finally stopped. But I, I think that's an excellent question. It's important to remember that LDS bishops are not trained clergy. In the LDS church, um, the bishops and the clergy are drawn from the congregation. They are not specially trained pastors or they don't receive any special training other than being handed the bishop's handbook. And so they're kind of operating on their own without a lot of guidance and support. And um, I think that had this person been your typical clergy member, that you would have seen them 
um, immediately say this person has a severe mental health issue and needs to be hospitalized. Um, but for whatever reason, that particular bishop was convinced that it was spiritual and not medical. So that's a good question. Any chance you will start doing two episodes a week again once Chad tri Chad's trial starts? Well, here's the thing. Um, my plan is to do two episodes a week, but one of those episodes is going to be exclusive to the launch team. So if you really want that second episode, um, please hop on over to thegoodlory.com and um, sign in over there, order the book, and uh, we will send you the PDF as soon as it's available, which is likely going to be in June. And uh, until then, uh, we'll be doing one episode a week. And once the trial starts, we'll be continuing to do Wednesday nights. And uh, probably at that point, that entire two hours will be devoted to the Daybell trial. And then we'll be doing uh, an extra episode for book launch folks. So consider that. Mary, did the judge tell uh, Brian Koberger's case? Uh, Oh, did the judge tell Brian Koberger's case, uh, A.T. and Taylor, to get on with defining his alibi? Um, I think that there were some motions that went back and forth about his alibi. And I do believe that the judge said, you need to be a little bit more specific about what you think his alibi was. Because at this point, all they've said was, he was driving around. But they did say that they have identified a witness who can confirm his alibi. And that was information that was new to the prosecution. And they were going back and forth about the defense needing to disclose that witness. So, um, so I think that is an ongoing uh, battle <laughs> that is going on between Ann Taylor and the prosecution. Good questions, guys. Uh, is there any minute possible, oh, minute possibility that Chad can walk free? I can't see it, but always wanted to ask. Thanks in advance. Thanks, Betsy Barn. Betsy's Barn. Um, anytime there is a trial and a jury has the option of guilty or not guilty, there is a chance that they will find the defendant not guilty. Now, Chad is not being charged on any other charges. He did not get charged in Arizona, at least not at this point. So if Chad were to be found not guilty, he could walk free. Now, do I think that that is a possibility? I, I don't. Uh, it's not high on my list of, of possibilities to come out of the trial. Um, but anytime you have a trial and you put it in the hands of a jury, a not guilty verdict is always a possibility, even if it's slim, even if you think, man, the evidence was overwhelming. Uh, let's remember that OJ was found not guilty. So uh, it happens. And um, so uh, the prosecution is going to go and do their absolute best. And they're going to put their best case on. And John Pryor is going to go and do his absolute best with some pretty bad facts. And um, we'll see what happens. I, I'm not sure a, a, a not guilty verdict is likely, but it's always possible. Good question. That is the reason why prosecutors are always happy to cut plea deals because then the opportunity to be found not guilty goes away. There's no longer any chance that a jury is gonna go rogue and find somebody not guilty. Now, I know because I have been told by people who are um, uh, reliable that Chad has been offered pleas and that he has not been amenable to the kinds of offers they have made, um, which essentially is what Lori got. And um, I think that Chad is not the most sophisticated guy in the room and not the brightest. 
And I think that there is a part of him who absolutely believes that because he did not put his hands on any of the victims and cause their deaths directly, that he is not guilty. Um, I think that it is just beyond him to understand um, the nuance of conspiracy or aiding and abetting. So these are all great questions. Let's see, GSD cell. Lori, is the Mormon church going to face an investigation for their part in referring people to Jody Hildebrand? You know, I don't know. I would hope so, but I don't know. Um, what I know about the church is they are very insular and they are very much self-policing. And um, I don't know that there would be an investigation beyond what would happen in the church. Now, she, what, Jody Hildebrand was licensed through the state of Utah, and it is possible that the state of Utah could investigate. Um, but I, I don't know that the state of Utah really has much influence or much to say, much jurisdiction over who the LDS Church recommends their congregation to. So... Um, the licensing board has something to say about Jody Hildebrand and her behavior and, and that she is no longer licensed, but I don't know that there's anyone who could really call the church uh, to account for it, except the church. And I don't know that um, we've seen the church be very successful at self-policing. That's the nicest way I can think of to say that. <laughs> oh, we did that one. Let me see. We've got just a couple more minutes. So let's see if we, oh, I got that one too. Uh, oh, do I, Debbie, uh, this was, question was a little bit different. Do I think Garth will be called to testify against his dad? I don't know how much information the prosecution could get from Garth in terms of him testifying against his dad. But then we don't really know. We know that he was called in front of the grand jury and that he testified in front of the grand jury. We have never seen any of his statements. So we don't really know what it is that he's going to testify to. I certainly have never gotten the impression that Chad's any of Chad's children were um, aligned against him. And so uh, I, I would be very surprised if the prosecution had any information that they would call him to testify. Uh, but I do think it's possible that John Pryor could call him as a defense witness. Uh, oh, Susie, will I talk about the new charges for Corey Richens? There were some new charges for Corey Richens. To be honest, when I looked at them, I didn't see that they were particularly, they seemed to be a little bit more refined. Um, and there were, I, I think there were a couple more drug charges. But I'll tell you what, I will look into that. I will look at it again because I... There was so much that happened this week that I, I sort of glossed past it and didn't look into it in depth. So I promise that I will look into it for next week. Um, and I I jotted her name down on my list and I was going to go back and, and, and look at it and then I didn't have any notes. So um, I'll go back and, and take a look at it more in depth because I like to answer your questions. Uh, Ann Chapman, how come... Uh, Kevin wasn't charged in any of this. Well, I think that when law enforcement interviewed him, having done both the interviews, having seen both of his interviews, I think they really felt like in many ways he was a victim. Um, I think they also felt that he had been separated and, and it was very clear that he had had no contact with his children for a long time, for months. Um, so I think that there it would have been very difficult for law enforcement to connect a causal, to, to come up with a causal connection. Kevin 
was absolutely responsible for the day, the injuries that were done to the children. There really was very little uh, to connect him other than the fact that he didn't have contact with them and failed to protect them. That's more of a child protective services issue than it is a criminal issue. Um, I know that sounds kind of sketchy and people think, how is that, you know, how is it not a crime not to take care of your kids? Um, but it really is more of a child welfare case uh, issue. And it could very well be that child welfare says you didn't protect your kids, you're not getting them back. So there's that out there. Um, but as far as the criminal charges go, I think the uh, law enforcement really felt like they could not make a case for him being directly responsible for the injuries to the children. And that's kind of what they have to do. So I see a couple of last questions. Um, here's a question. Can Richard Allen's wife sue the judge if he dies in prison? Um, I think it is very possible that his family could bring a wrongful death suit, particularly if, um, if an appeal later exonerates him. Um, and the appeal, oftentimes appeals, they will, if someone, if a defendant dies while some, an appeal is, is pending, um, the appellate court will say it's moot because we can't, we can't give him any uh, recourse because he's no longer with us. But I think it is very possible they could bring a wrongful death suit. Yeah. Um, I'm going to keep my fingers crossed that he doesn't die in prison. I'm going to keep my fingers crossed that he uh, gets released. Jeremy Best case, Teton County, not Canyon County. Thank you for that correction. Um, I've been saying Canyon County and um, I, I, I am a, a, a short time Idahoan and not as familiar with the counties here as I am in my, my old home state. So thanks for that correction. Um, I will do my best to remember that uh, and uh, get the right county. Oh, my, here's Susan who says, your next book should be a comparison between Lori Vallow and Ruby Frank Einstein. Um, that's a possibility. I also have a couple of idea, uh, a couple of other ideas for uh, for another true crime book. Um, so stay tuned for that because uh, I've got some ideas on a couple of other cases that I might be interested in. So, um, but you're right, Lori Vallow and, and Ruby Frankie, because you all know that the cases that interest me are the ones that have lots of layers and that there are things, there are other things um, other than just the legal issues that interest me. So, um, so I want to say thanks to everybody. I am absolutely going to uh, go back through the chat and I will pick up your questions for next week and definitely um, post your questions in the comments if you would like, uh, like me to respond. Um, I want to say thanks again to everybody who's pre-ordered the book already. Um, the response has been astonishing. Thank you. Um, there, as I've said before, there are still a few slots available if you want to join the launch team and get an early PDF of the book um, in return for, for posting a review. Folks who sign up for the launch team are going to get some exclusive um, uh, Q&A time with me, as well as some exclusive updates from Chad Daybell's trial. So um, there'll be some goodies to, to get as a result. Thank you to Jen. I know that she was here doing her utmost to moderate and uh, I, I appreciate her being here in spite of the technical difficulties tonight. Thank you so much for all your patience when these little glitches come up. I appreciate it. I'm sorry if I didn't get to everybody's questions, 
but I will go back through them and um, please repost them in the chat so that I can answer. Thanks again for everybody spending your Wednesday evening with me. I know that you could be doing a lot of other things. Thank you for your support. And I will see you next week. Good night.